Thanks for inviting me and for having me um, sharing our research. Um, my name is Florian. Um, at TU Berlin, I had a, a research group and we are working on the intersection of distributed systems on the one hand and uh, security and privacy on the other hand. And um, for today, I would like to share um, some of our ideas, um, in particular, a very specific idea for a very specific privacy problem um, that we see in um, the BitSwap protocol. And that's the talk. Um, so let's dive in. Um, the problem that we see is that CID requests or BitSwap requests in general leak um, the interest. Um, and that might be quite um, sensitive. Um, so it might be quite sensitive uh, with respect to what are clients interested in, uh, what kind of data are they uh, interested in. And um, also, we could also frame it on the other hand, um, providing data um, might be um, as well as uh, sensitive, um, providing a certain kind of data. So we see that CID requests leak um, the interest. Um, we could also even go further um, that by seeing a particular kind of interest in a particular kind of um, CIDs um, that might be used uh, to fingerprint clients, for example, um, and therefore also can be used to track over time. So that's the, the motivation for the setting and our primary goal was, and I said, it's a very specific problem um, that we are looking at, is to obfuscate these items of interest. And our main metrics um, in order to evaluate um, these, uh, um, um, this primary goal is that on the one hand, we uh, look for low latency. So the number of round trip times um, should be as small, ideally um, not more than the bit swap uh, requests uh, or the handshake anyway. In addition to that, uh, we say the computational effort on the, um, on the server side, so the content provider, um, should be fairly small. Otherwise, we have an um, attack vector uh, with respect to denial of service attacks. Um, so this should be quite small and scalable. An optional, which we consider a nice benefit, but on the other hand, if the client who is interested in some um, data um, might perform some additional computation um, that is fine to us, but still we don't want to increase um, the overhead um, um, unnecessarily. So this is, this is also something that we keep in mind, but it's not um, the primary uh, metric. Um, in order to tackle this uh, goal, we see two directions that we can that we can go for uh, this. That is, on the one hand, a cryptographic approach, um, and on the other hand, a network level approach. Network level approaches um, um, include something like forwarding, rerouting, and caching, all to obfuscate. Um, the original requester um, by using indirections and so on. So though that might help. And the quality of privacy that we will get from this kind of uh, approach is, um, I would say, something um, like plausible deniability. So you can deny that you are the requester of a certain uh, a CID because it was rerouted or it could be rerouted, uh, it could have been rerouted. And um, so that's that's the, the level of, of um, these network um, approaches. The one that I would like to uh, focus on today is a cryptographic approach. The, um, the pros of cryptographic approaches are that they provide us more um, strong guarantees that we that we can derive from that. So it's, it's more clearly defined um, what we can gain. And um, what I would like to discuss today is a particular cryptographic approach and that is private set intersection. And uh, I would like to share this idea with you. And I'm very curious also about your feedback on that. Um, so, um, yeah, let's see um, about this main idea and consider it also as a general tool um, in order to solve um, these or similar problems. Okay, so what is private set intersection? Private set intersection is a cryptographic approach and the main idea, you have two sets that could be the client's wants and the server halves. Um, and what we want to find out is, does the server have my 
CIDs that I'm interested in as a client. And so what we basically do here is to calculate the intersection of these two sets if we consider the ones by a client as a set and the halves of a server as a set. And so what we are interested in is we want to get this intersection to the client. So the client should learn, does a server provide this particular CID that he or she is interested in without revealing the whole set of interests to the server. And that is the main goal um, that uh, private center section can indeed provide. Um, it can provide this particular kind of um, learning. So the client learns the intersection um, without revealing um, the set to the server. Um, to be fair, what usually what you usually uh, still learn as a server, and I get to all these implicit um, uh, implications and assumptions in a second, but what you typically learn uh, also as a server is the set size. Um, so that that depending on which exact um, protocol you are you are focusing on, um, there is a certain private uh, a certain information leak. Um, to the server, but nothing that I would consider uh, uh, um, incriminating. All right, so that is um, the general setting. And now let's talk how we can um, bring that uh, to life, how we would um, think of integrating that uh, into the BitSwap protocol. So here's an overview of how the uh, C, how the CID request or how the BitSwap protocol works. Probably you all know that better than um, me. Um, but anyway, let, let's briefly get get through this. Um, so you have a client. The client usually sends one halves to uh, a number of servers. These servers um, then answer. And um, in particular, what's interesting is um, the half CIDs, so the list of CIDs that a particular server can offer. But still, in the usual process, also the server, all the servers learn the whole set. So that's exactly the, the big problem by, by uh, distributing and broadcasting all my one halves, all the servers, independent of whether they have it or they haven't uh, um, it, um, they will learn my interests. Um, as soon as I know from which server I can um, download the file, I can send my want blocks uh, for this particular CID and then um, get the data transfer uh, going. Um, there's also the DHT requests. Uh, Will in his introduction already mentioned um, this differentiation, um, but for this uh, talk and for simplicity, we ignore um, the DHT request for a second. So what, what does that give us? If we now would simply assume we can perform um, um, private set intersection, what would that give us? What it would give us is that this list of one halves will be indeed protected, except for the size of that. So the, the size will be leaked to the service, as I, as I mentioned, um, but it's still protected. It will be somehow encrypted, and the server cannot um, know the exact CID that the client is interested in. As soon as the client, uh, the server answers to the client, the client learns something about the service set. Um, and um, in particular, that means the, the client learns which servers have or have not a particular CID. So if server zero answers with a half for a particular CID, then the client learns that this server has the uh, information, which is also an information leakage. But um, we could argue that a server um, that provides a file um, um, that is that is acceptable, um, but you could also draw a um, attacker model where this is also a no go. Um, it really depends, as will introduced um, on the uh, attacker model that we define. And for us, um, and for this protocol, we say it's okay to reveal um, this information to the client. And then, as soon as the client starts the file transfer and sends the want block for a particular CID, then also the server learns this interest in this particular file. Again, this is an implicit assumption that we that we make. 
it is okay as soon as you start the file transfer, um, it is okay to leak um, what you are interested in um, because um, this, this still um, limits and mitigates the client's interests um, that cannot be observed by everyone, uh, only if you provide these files. And now, of course, you can start um, uh, designing certain attacks, and we can discuss about that um, um, if we have time for that in a Q&A session. But still, this um, I hope you see that it really limits the amount of, um, of information um, about the interests of a particular client. So what we are envisioning is a, a, a protocol that is based on um, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, See, um, it's a very particular kind of approach that um, fulfills our uh, privacy metrics because um, it um, puts quite um, the, the um, um, heavy computational work on the client side and not so much on the server side. Um, I, we've, we argue that it's fairly um, doable for the server um, since it's only um, uh, uh, done once um, and it will not introduce um, many additional RTTs. We could also design it um, that we will have no additional RTTs. So that's, that's, that's good. Um, it all begins with um, an initial half by a server. You could think of that, and this is why I marked that with a star, you could think of that as an in inventory. Um, we could also name it an inventory message, but we stick to the semantics of the half message. Um, it could be sent and um, distributed um, unsolicited um, among the um, neighbors by the server, or it could also be piggybacked as soon as the um, as server answers to a want half with a half message. Um, it depends, um, but for the clarity of this presentation, I will um, consider it um, here as a single separate message um, that is uh, similar to an inventory message. And what you encode in this set basically is an encrypted um, set of your actual CIDs. Um, you use homomorphic encryption, so you build it or, or transform it into onto an elliptic curve, and then you take it to the power of a random number, and this random number construction is basically the Diffie-Hellman um, key exchange. Um, so the first part of the key exchange. Um, and then you send this encrypted um, set to the client. The client um, stores this um, set and produces the want half um, according to this um, part. This is the second part of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, and then we have a certain re-encryption um, where the server takes the set V and takes each item, iterates over each item in V and re-encrypts that by um, using um, his uh, random number and um, um, calculating the power of uh, um, these Vs um, to this random number and producing a W. And this W basically is then uh, or can be used by the client to double check um, this these items in V and checking whether they are also existent in the set of U. Um, and um, you can do the math here, but this is really the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol um, that gives you, uh, you can do that um, without revealing um, um, any information to the server except the set size. So here you can really see the server iterates over each item and learns the set size. But then the client knows um, which server has or don't have the uh, uh, CIDs that the client is interested in, and then can initiate uh, the want block, um, basically, um, and uh, we can start the file transfer. So that's the major idea. Uh, where are some issues that we already um, identified? Well, depending on the number of IDs or CIDs that the server has locally, this can become quite a large set. Uh, and each item um, is an encrypted uh, uh, CID, which bloats a little bit um, um, this set. And so this can become an overhead that we identify. And in order to um, tackle this, um, we also um, 
thought about the idea of combining that with, with a probabilistic um, data structure. So consider a Bloom filter. Um, we argue that Kuko filters might be um, beneficial or more uh, superior to Bloom filters. But anyway, Bloom filters are probably more known. So let me stick to Bloom filters here. And the idea is um, we map um, this um, set U onto a Bloom filter. And this Bloom filter can then be used and inspected by the client um, and still um, perform the same operations that we uh, discussed before. Um, but instead of sending each and every item individually, we hash that to a Bloom filter. And since it is a probabilistic data structure, um, we also get only a probabilistic answer to that. So there might be some false positives where one CID maps to the same bit as another CID, which gives us a certain false positive rate. Um, uh, Bloom filters have the ability to adjust this false positive rate, but anyway, um, we cannot uh, exclude um, this uh, entirely, um, but still this it reduces the amount of um, data that needs to be transferred quite significantly um, and um, uh, therefore scales much better for large sets. And that is, um, as you can see, still um, integratable into this handshake as we have uh, sketched it before. Um, as I said, this half star can also be piggybacked with this half, and then we have the exact same protocol um, work, uh, the protocol flow as the original bit swap, and um, we don't use any additional RTT. All right, so let's see what we have accomplished um, with this protocol. Um, first of all, um, our goal was to protect client privacy um, and strengthen uh, server privacy. And we argue that um, private set intersection can be a tool to achieve this goal. Um, in particular, what it can uh, achieve is it really mitigates the non-selective distribution of CIDs. You leak CIDs to the relevant service, um, but not to the whole network. Um, and that might be um, uh, helpful to increase privacy. From our initial assessment, when we, when we thought about that, um, our gist is basically that we indeed can integrate that into the BitSwap uh, protocol with very reasonable overhead. Um, I hope I was able to at least give you an intuition what it would take to, to integrate that. Um, there is a certain initial overhead on the server side. Um, it needs to generate this half star message, the inventory. Um, but we argue that this can be a a single one-time computation that does not need to be um, repeated every, um, every time. So it's fairly acceptable in our opinion. Um, there is an overhead for the want halves, um, but it is negligible because um, um, we assume that this is also not as um, large as uh, um, the uh, uh, half side. Um, all follow-up requests do not require any resending of stored CIDs. This is, this is uh, great as well. So we really need to do this half star only once. And we have no additional RTGs because messages can also be piggybacked. Where are we at the moment? So uh, we are um, looking into the, still into the issue of large sets in particular, what does it mean to integrate a, uh, um, a probabilistic data structure such as a Bloom filter? Um, when do we generate that? How do we adjust this? Um, do we hold multiple Bloom filters uh, for different set sizes and so on? So that, that is uh, still uh, some work in progress. Um, but our next steps are um, to have a prototypical implementation um, into the BitSwap protocol and um, run an evaluation to really understand what it would take to integrate that and also how it would look more on how it would perform on a more global scale. So we would like to simulate that. Um, in order to do that, we already identified uh, some crypto libraries that offer us this um, um, elliptic curve-based um, 
um, private set intersection. Um, just um, after the golden rule, don't implement your own crypto. Um, we we identified some um, that we can that we can utilize here. And um, yeah, that's that's the current uh, approach. And uh, for future work, we also think about so uh, private set intersection offers you also um, the data transfer to be secured, um, not leaking much um, information there as well. So we look into transferring or integrating the data transfer um, into this protocol as well. And also what we are thinking about is um, how we can also take the main idea to maybe DHT requests, which I ignored for most of the part of my talk today, um, but um, we're also thinking about that as well. All right, so that concludes my talk. If you're interested in this uh, work or the work my group does in general, please reach out. Um, you can uh, find um, my uh, contact details here. You can also find me on Twitter. Um, and um, yeah, I, I wish you a great uh, uh, conference. Um, so I would love to be there. Unfortunately, due to teaching obligations, um, it's not possible for me to travel at the moment. Um, but this will change very soon because the semester break is in reach. Um, so yeah, um, uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much for this work. Um, it's really great to great to have it, um, and, and yeah, look forward to to um, be able to deploy it into the network. I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, maybe you mentioned this, but how big are the sets? Like the the um, the, the, the boom filtered version. Uh, what sort of like uh, is reasonable overhead? But just get, want to get a sense of like how much overhead that is. Mm -hmm. um, I did not entirely get the question. I understand that you are interested in the uh, overhead of the different sets, and uh, so. The size uh, of the bloom filters that you're going to end up. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Um, great. Um, so um, the size of a bloom filter um, depends on um, the, the false positive rate. Um, so you can adjust the false positive rate based on an assumption on the number of sets that you would like to hash um, into the bloom filter um, and the false positive rate that it should yield. And that gives there's a there's a clear formula um, that you can that can, you can use um, for many let's say reasonably large sizes of sets, um, you can assume something like um, 256 bits. Um, so we really talk about bits, not bytes um, here, uh, and we would measure that more in, in the bit area. Um, so that's um, something that we consider. It also depends a little bit on how many hash functions you use. More hash functions means you, you are more resilient to false positives. Um, but in the end, um, this also enlarges um, the uh, bloom filter as well. At some point, the bloom filter will be full and useless. So you really have to make some assumptions, and that is the crucial point, on the set size. Um, and therefore, I said, we also think about um, setting up multiple categories or types uh, of sizes um, so that we can dynamically go one step larger and exchange that uh, a larger bloom filter if we, for some reason, see that the set size increases. Um, so we want to be independent of the uh, of the sets that we see and measure, can measure in the um, IPFS networks, for example, if we look at the uh, CID distribution among servers. Does, does your set have to model the full space of CIDs? So like, or, or just the CIDs on a given server? Um, presumably it's uh, all because other, like that's what is potentially queried. And so yeah. that starts to be billions. It's on a single server. So it's, it's... But your false yeah. positive rate is going to be any query, which is not just the set of that server, right? It's the number of CIDs you put into it. So basically, you need at least 1.7 bits to get 100% in Bloom Filter. Um, and then like, it, you, you care about how many things you put in the set, not how many things could exist in the universe. So um, the, the, the um, set size depends on how many CIDs this particular server holds. It's not the entire set of CIDs that exist in the whole network, that's not necessary. Um, it's really um, only what this CI, uh, this server holds um, locally. Uh, and this is this is what um, 
um, makes makes the uh, or requires that the, that the bloom filter has a certain size. Um, uh, when do I have to remake you? Do I have to remake you for every single client, or can I have one you that have just kept locally? Every server has to do this uh, uh, um, once and they can share it with multiple clients. Um, that's, that's the beauty of it. Um, so it's really necessary to do this only once. Um, the nice thing of using a Kuko filter is um, that you can also delete items from the filter. Um, so as soon as the set changes of a server, um, if you're using a Bloom filter, you might um, might be forced to recalculate the bloom filter because the set changed. Um, you can add new ones, but as soon as you um, drop a few CIDs, you usually have to recalculate the bloom filter, which is also not a huge overhead, but this is something that we can avoid if we use a, a data structure that offers you also deletion. Um, and the Google filter can, can provide that as well. Um, and so you really have an you can you can um, use incremental updates, so adding new CRDs and removing CRDs um, and not recalculating everything from scratch. Okay. Two two notes. Um, uh, one, uh, it's often a technical pop up protocol, so that may be one other thing here. Where, like this works really good in a request response portal, <laughs> uh, but it does mean that like I can't send you a want and have you service to someone in the future if you end up with the data. Uh, so it means that like you don't have it right now, I'm not going to get it right now. I have to keep asking one note. The other note is like we, we do also have nodes that have like, billions of, of items, or at least many millions of items, and that becomes a bit of a problem here. But this is really good for like the small client, small client situations. Um, uh, it seems to me that if you keep the, if you find a good size for the bloom filter, you can actually use the bloom filters and aggregate the bloom filters themselves across different servers. For example, if you had another downstream server beyond this one that was connected to the other server, you could start doing transitive want halves um, in a pretty efficient way. So it's not about the, the, the security necessarily, but you could you could take the other server set, aggregate it with this one, and, and um, propagate it to the client, or even just propagate like the, the neighboring sets, and that, that way you have like a like a larger search space that is still very compressed in terms of the, the over the total overhead. So indeed, yes, you can you can you can think about that. But in order to accomplish um, the uh, combination of Bloom filters, um, we have to keep uh, a few things in mind. We need to agree on the same hash functions, so that's fairly easy to to um, do in a protocol. Um, but um, then we probably need to rethink the uh, private set intersection part because we have a private value um, um, here and that is the um, random number um, by the uh, server and that is this, uh, the server secret. Um, and if we combine different um, Loom filters by different servers, we will mix and match the different uh, values um, from different servers. And that makes it a little bit more difficult to do. But if we, for example, say we simply skip um, and ignore the whole uh, private set intersection part and use Bloom filters only and um, let the privacy guarantees only um, reside on the uh, idea of false positives that could give you some kind of plausible deniability, by the way, um, already, um, then you could also start combining them as well. That is true, yes. I don't know if this is mentioned earlier in the talk, but like, this could also be used for private content routing. Uh, so like large service could like, publish sets to somewhere. Yep. Cool, thank you. Um, thank you very much.